space. It's not working. Yeah, we're okay to start, Chair. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session of the Economy and Resources Scrutiny Committee on the Thursday, the 1st of April. Hope everyone is well, and if we could just move on to the first item on the agenda, which is the introductions and attendance at the meeting. Um, have you got any apologies, Shirley? Uh, I haven't got any apologies, Chair, no. Okay. Okay, um, in attendance at the meeting, could, would you mind just going around the room, just uh, introducing everyone, please, Shirley? Yep, so I've got uh, Councillor Barch. Thanks, just come in. Yep, Councillor Boddy. Hello. Councillor Crudus. Hello. Hello. Councillor Durham, the chair. Good morning. Councillor Harker. Hello. Councillor Hughes. Morning. Oh, still there. Yep. Councillor Jones. Sorry. Morning, Shirley. Morning. Uh, Councillor McEwen. Morning, uh, colleagues. Councillor Paley. Morning. I can see you there, Councillor Paley. Councillor Renton. Present. And Councillor Tate. Morning, Shirley. Morning. Uh, Councillor Barcher, I have got you, cut you down as well. So in terms of off, we've got two uh, cabinet members, we've got Councillor Johnson, Councillor Marshall and Councillor Kia. Officers, we've got Elizabeth Davison, Mike Crawshaw, Mark Ladyman, Anthony Sandys, Chris Mains, and Andrew Perkins. And I think that's that's everybody. Yes, I've missed anybody off. I think that's everybody who's on. OK, Thanks, thank, Chair. thank you very much. OK, uh, number two on the agenda, which is any declarations of interest. OK, I've got Councillor Tate. Yeah, it was just for the record before we move on to agenda items number seven and eight. I work for BT and EE. OK, thank you very much. Julie noted. OK, uh, we then move on to agenda item number three, which are the minutes um, of this meeting held on the 4th of February. Uh, has everybody had a chance to read the minutes? OK, does anybody have any have any comments uh, to make with regards to the minutes? OK. I propose to um, move the minutes to have a seconder. Seconded. OK, thank you very much, Councillor Curtis. OK, uh, agenda item number four, which are the performance indicators for quarter three, 2020-2021. This is a report of the managing director. And is this going to be you that's picking this up, Mark? I think it's Elizabeth, is it? Elizabeth, are you picking this up? I think Councillor Durham, um, all of the officer, officers are here. Obviously, this is quite a wide portfolio Fine. and covers a number of different areas. So it's really a case of if any members got any questions on any of the particular areas. And I think, as I say, all of the officers are here that will be able to, to respond to those queries. This is the quarter three report. Um, and you may notice some of the, the indicators were slightly different, I think, with it being a stranger um, with regard to the, the coronavirus, um, some of the indicators might not be as they had been. Um, but yeah, I think it's over to members, please, Chair. Thank you, Elizabeth. OK, so I'll open it up to the floor. OK, I've got Councillor Hughes. Helps if I come off mute. Thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, just a couple of, of comments. I mean, I've just regarding um paragraph 14 and sickness substance obviously uh it, you know it, it just a concern that on reading this that people might get the wrong impression i think it you know it needs to be written clear that um that, that this the report 
um, is skewed because of the the previous you know what, what's happened in the previous year with COVID and sickness absences across the board with employee employers have dropped because with people working from home people are are more likely to not call in sick um, because they you know because of the flexibility of working from home so something that might have stopped them from you know a slight a cold or whatever they'll actually carry on working from home um, because of that um, but the the concern obviously is is the stress and I, I know we we are dealing with that and the survey has has gone out um, and the same with health and safety uh, again it it whilst yes it looks good that we've got less accidents again that's because people are working from 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 home um, and are less likely to report something um, due to due to that um, just coming to the actual um, appendix one I'll just on ECI 329 and, and 330 which is the annual incomes of, uh, of residents and employees uh, of, of Pleased to see that the you know, average in, annual income in Darlington employees is actually going up. But can you just explain why we use the average and not the median? Because the median gives a, a more of a realistic figure of, uh, for salaries, and it's actually what the Office for National Statistics use when reporting the figures. Um, and I, just just to make the comment as well that yes, it's good, it's going up. But if you compare um, again, referring to the Office for National Statistics, in in reality, uh, salaries have actually gone down by just under three percent from 2008 so yes it, it looks like it's going up but in real terms um it, people are actually earning less now than they were in 2008 thank you okay do you want to come in on that elizabeth um, not on the, um, the the EC one, I'm sure Mark will be able to handle that. It was just a bit on um, with regard to the sickness. Yes, obviously the stress is concerning. Um, it was just to let you know, actually, on the stress statistics, there hasn't been any difference between the people working from home and people actually at work. Um, the, the working from home serve, sorry, going on the wrong subject. The sickness analysis at quarter three um, looked at the, at the stress and um, yeah, there doesn't seem to be any difference between whether people were working from home or whether people were actually at work with regard to stress. Um, obviously it is a concern and, and as Councillor Hughes said, we are actively managing all of the cases there. Um, also with regard to health and safety, um, uh, yeah, I understand the point that if people are not at work, they're not reporting, but it, it is really good news that these are reportable accidents and it's gone from four to two. And actually the reportable accidents are usually in the areas, not office areas where people are working from home. This is for people usually out on the ground and they're still out on the ground. So I do think we need to congratulate ourselves that we are actually proactively managing health and safety and all the work that the teams have been doing over the years to get these accidents down is, uh, is coming to fruition. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Elizabeth. Have we got any other officers who want to come in and comment? Chair, do you want me to comment on the um, average pay? Please. Yeah, um, we actually collate these through um, a, a system called NORMIS, which is collected right across the country. So we use this as a, I suppose, as a comparator with other economic areas. But I'll look into the uh, ONS um, collation as well that, that the councillor, uh, I think it was Councillor Hughes previously raised with regards to looking at how that compares with the enormous uh, collation. Thank you, Mark. Does that answer your questions, Councillor Hughes? Yes, thank you. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just on the going back to the health and safety. I mean, yes, I mean, it is, uh, I think it, it, it is worth um, you know, saying a big, you know, thanks for the health and safety, because bearing in mind, um, you know, it's our, mainly our street scene uh, and, you know, our operatives are, are, who are actually out there and, and bearing in mind with, with the pandemic, the fact that we haven't had a major incident um, regarding anything, you know, it, 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 that does deserve recognition. Thank you. Got uh, Councillor Harker. Thank you, Chair. Um, couple of comments on two different indicators uh, and similarly on EC321 which uh, Councillor Hughes has just been sorry 329 which Councillor Hughes has just been commenting on the average annual income of Darlington residents um, if I'm reading this chart correctly has dropped in the last two reported years from 26,000 to you know, just under 23,000 which in 
is about 13% fall plus whatever inflation is on top of that to give it a, you know, a greater value than 30% in real terms. Do we have any understanding why it's dropped so much um, in a single year when, comparatively speaking, um, talent employees who are presumed proportion of people travelling into, into town, it's risen very slightly. It seems quite a difference um, in terms of those two outcomes. And then the second comment is on uh, the EC 104 and 105, which is the two indicators on planning applications. And I think in the narrative, it notes that for the, the major planning applications, that because we don't get that many, uh, the figures can vary hugely just on the basis of a single application, how long it takes to determine, which is a is an explanation. But I also note that there's been a downturn in the non-major planning applications in terms of meeting the timescales. So what I suggest is also an argument to say that that we've not been performing well in either of them, and it's not because we've been caught out on one or two possibly difficult major applications. And I just wondered if someone could comment on whether what the underlying trends in is, is and whether there's a common theme between both or whether for some reason the minor ones are underperforming for a different reason to possibly what the reason is for the major one. Thank you, Chair. Mark, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, if, if, if I may, uh, Chair, um, could I start off with the planning ones? Uh, Councillor Hart is quite correct that we don't get many major applications, so therefore any type of, of um, I suppose, uh, lateness in, in, in actually processing and validating and also then actually determining them will have a ha have a, a, an effect on that particular um, on that particular performance. With regards to the minor ones, again, it is a slight drop and we do get a lot of minor applications in. A lot of these things can be around about COVID in regards to staff, et cetera, um, getting out and, and carrying out the work. But um, I'm assured by uh, the head of planning that this is just a slight blip in the in, in the performances. And there's a numerous reasons why, uh, as I mentioned earlier, with regards to, to staffing that this particular performance may may have dropped slightly. But we're, we're very confident that we can get back to our our usual um, high quality and, and high turnaround of, of, of planning applications, Chair. Uh, with regards to the to the take home pay and the average pay, etc. There are numerous issues around this. One is obviously there's an increase in unemployment, which has an impact on, on take home pay. But likewise, you have also have to look at the demographics as well. We still have an aging population, so more people are moving into in, in, into uh, retirement, etc. So therefore, the take home pay does reduce. Um, or the household uh, uh, income does reduce. So there, there are there are numerous uh, types of facets to to this um, particular one. Um, not 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 in, not excluding the two that I've already mentioned, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Does that answer your question, Councillor Hark? You're on mute, Councillor Harker. First one for this morning. Um, if What I didn't appreciate was in terms of income then, from what Mark has said, it's not just earnings from um, employment, but it's things like presumably pension and unemployment um, payments. Is that correct? That, that's correct. Right. That's correct. For the take home household, there's, there's two different ones. There's the household income and there's also earnings. So in in here, which because it just refers to its average annual income, is it that that would that would include right across the right across the gambit, right. Uh, chair? Right. Okay. Thank you, okay. Councillor McEwen. Uh, thank you, chair. Um, if I could um, pick up on comments made by uh, Ms. Davidson in relation to um, stress. And uh, we, we noted that there was no differentiation between, uh, well, it hasn't changed. So there's there's an indication that homeworking hasn't impacted. Um, I'm not wishing to overanalyze this, is, is, there any, is there any further work to be done around looking at the different uh, segmenting, segmenting that? And the reason I raise it, clearly, the, um, homeworking has 
have been a seismic or significant change for a lot of people um, and it, it could be well I uh, love it or hate it so younger people with kids in smaller properties might be getting stressed but all older old lags like me so to speak might be thinking oh this is very good I can roll out of bed and uh, go into the home office um, so uh, and I, as I say I, do, I wouldn't want to wish to create more work but I do think it's something that we do need to keep an eye on uh, going forward and perhaps I hear HR colleagues I, I would presume are linking into work that's no doubt being done nationally by CIPD and um, the Institute of Personnel Management so I don't know why that's a question or a comment chair if I could just come in there, Chair. Yeah, just to um, confirm, we are doing a lot more work on this. So we're nearly at year end and we're going to be doing a full analysis of all of the um, the, the sickness. And obviously that comes back to this committee as a, an annual report. But yes, we have been doing um, specific analysis on, on stress because we have been worried about it. So we've been actively managing each and every case. And also with regard to from working from home, um, the as you know, the Agile Working Project's ongoing and we had a working from home survey out that just closed last week. So the analysis has been done on that. Um, but we have got some high levels and that's why I know that there doesn't seem to be a difference in the stress between home working and people who are actually at work as well. Um, what we have found, though, is that stress is far more prevalent in women as opposed to men. Um, and I know that, as you say, we have been linking in the CIPD and that appears to be this case across the country as well on ONS, um, where, and this isn't just for Darlington, but we have um, anecdotal evidence saying that um, the women have been more stressed and it has been due to anxiety and loneliness and, and depression. So, um, I mean, I'm not the expert on this. My HR colleagues are, are diving into it a bit more, but just to, to confirm, um, Councillor, that we are, taking this very seriously and doing a lot more analysis on it. Chair, um, may I come back? Of course. Um, yeah, just to add to that, and anecdotally, I do recall a discussion um, with somebody in an, another business sector about particularly younger women with children. And it was all quite, you know, sweet and quaint and quirky, you know, uh, while when it started, uh, a little toddler running around and and mum um sort of oh look at that and then um comment was made to me probably in the summer that you could start to see particularly in young women the sort of visible stress of trying to manage uh, that situation so i do, you know it, it's reassuring uh, to hear that we are um continuing to monitor this because my view and i don't know whether colleagues would share this it will work for some people but not for everybody home working yeah, I mean, I, I can come back again. Um, the, we have had some very positive results, but these are high levels, so I didn't want to go into detail because the analysis needs to be done. Um, but in, I think it was about 80% of people felt still very comfortable working from a home environment, which has changed from the originally because we thought it was going to be 60 to 70%. So we don't know whether people are getting used to it whether the technology is a lot better, because obviously that caused a lot of stress at the beginning when you couldn't log on, notwithstanding that people have connection problems today. Um, uh, and of course, children going back to school is helpful yeah. as well. But yes, we are doing a lot more analysis uh, on this. So yeah, thank you for those comments. All I've got to worry about, Chair, is uh, the dog, not a young, young child, but that dog can be more demanding at times. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor McEwen. Um, and thank you, Elizabeth. Councillor Tate. Thank you, Chair. I know there's been a couple of questions from Councillor Hughes and Councillor Harker around the average annual income for Darlington residents. I'm just wondering, looking at them quarters, um, would would the 2019-2020 quarter be impacted by any furlough if people were reduced to 80%? I can't recall. Sorry, I'm just going to come on this one, Mark. I can't recall. Did, uh, did the furlough start from the 15th of March? 19? So there might have been a couple of weeks. Just because I'm comparing the drop between 2017-18 to 18-19 and it's about, you know, one as opposed to the four that we've got there. So I was just wondering if that could be any of the impact there. 
I'm thinking furlough really impacted on 2021, actually, because I think it was right. only a couple of weeks in 1920. OK, no problem. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tate. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. I've got Councillor Doris Jones. Thank you, Chair. Elizabeth, looking at the survey that was sent to us previously, I must first confess I meant to print it off and I haven't and I can't find it this morning. Um, but looking quickly at the questions, it just seemed to be a ticky box of yes and no's. I didn't see anywhere where um, staff could put a comment on as to why they've done a yes or a no, um, which could have helped a lot of the answers for the sickness, for example, uh, or the problem with children or, or, or IT. I didn't see anywhere on that. Perhaps I missed it. Please correct me. But um, I just felt it was a little bit, you know, straightforward and it wasn't exactly user friendly for the staff was my view. Thank you. Chair, if I could come back, I think that's the printed version online. There was other options and there was plenty of space for the people to be able to actually add comments in. And those come, we have got quite a few comments from the comments boxes as well. So that might have just been what you've seen in, in print. But yeah, staff seem to appreciate it and we had a very high return rate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Elizabeth. I've got Councillor Boddy. Yes, I just wanted to ask Elizabeth, in relation to the working from home uh, study, um, has any analysis been done in relation to petrol and diesel sales to assess how many people uh, are dropping petrol or diesel sales to, to assess how many people are no longer travelling to work uh, and home and commuting? Um, and I don't believe there has been anything, certainly not from the HR point of view, but what was captured was um, people who were not travelling and that came out as one of the advantages of not coming to work, the less fuel and, and petrol. But in, as far as I'm aware, I don't think there's been a study done on physical amount of fuel used. Just, uh, just before bringing Councillor Curtis, uh, Councillor Tate just asked a question with regards to the survey and what was the, the return rate, Elizabeth? 76%. And those who haven't re haven't returned, they're, they're, they're being chased up naturally, are they? Um, I, I, I can't give you a definite answer. I'm sure they have been, yes. Um, I'll speak to colleagues about that. Thank you. Councillor Curtis. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, it's good to see that all this work on stress analysis is going on, but in some ways it's um, we're looking back at the, the history of last year and hopefully this next year is going to be a, a different dynamic altogether. And I, I would hope that we that welcoming people back to work in, in previous style situations is something that we watch. Um, we we'll see how many people are skipping through the door and how many people are dragging their feet and to um, re really uh, and analyse how things might be uh, taken up as people go forward, knowing that they've got to come back to normal work as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Curtis. Um, if, if I could just ask a, a, a couple of questions. Just going back to um, ECI 329-330, and then just above it is EC, ECI 327. 2019-20, uh, um, there was noted just short of a 5% um, increase uh, in the, the employment rate. Um, sorry, 6%. Um, but then obviously the average income came came down. Um, is there a suggestion there then that there was naturally there was a an uplift in um, lower paid jobs within the town? Chair, yeah, as, as I um, uh, try to reply to Councillor Harker, that, that there is there is no particular one reason. You have to look at the the, the collection of, of of this data as regards to to, to the outcome quite happily to do a full analysis of the various types of of um, of, of um, influences on this particular uh, uh, performance indicator itself. But just to say that it was down to um, low paid employment is, is probably just looking at one individual um, uh, influencer on this particular particular performance indicator. Um, quite happy to to pull together for, for any future meeting and, and performance indicator analysis, the various types of 
of factors that were brought into um, actually attaining this particular indicator. Th thanks, Mark. I think that would be helpful. Um, and then my, my other question is on FHR 019, which is staff turnover. Um, and, and quite obviously staff turnover has has been um, lower than what it has been in previous years. We've potentially got a little bit of a bubble um, building up there. Um, so when businesses start to reopen any particular um, area um, of employees that may look to move on. Uh, not that I'm aware of, Councillor Durham. I mean, it was quite similar to the last this time last year, um, 5.2 or 5.4 now. Um, but you, you're right, there may be. There's no areas that people are identifying as a, a concern at the moment. Thank you, Elizabeth. OK, we've got any, any further questions? OK, none noted. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody contributing to, to that agenda item. OK, we move on to agenda item number five, which is the reopening of town centre businesses. Uh, this is a verbal update by the Assistant Director of Economic Growth. Thank you, Chair. This is going to be a double act between myself and uh, my colleague Mike Crawshaw. Uh, the reason why it's verbal is because it's still very much working progress because I think members will will appreciate that while we can um, put forward some some certainty as regards to what 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 will what we what we're going to be doing. Um, there is as again members will be aware there is there's differing changes and there's no no absolute um uh, certainty that that the each date will 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 be met we have to wait for those five weeks with regards to the impact of of uh, releasing uh, i suppose the um the activities of, of the population into the town but uh, just to give members some reassurance we have done a great deal of work for the uh, reopening or the um restricted reopening should i say of the town center from a week on monday i believe and uh, where we're looking at to ensure that uh, um sorry there's something popped up there uh, ensure that um not only do uh, hospitality uh, retail um, businesses have the uh, ability to open but uh, the overarching overarching uh, emphasis for us is to do it in a safe and safe manner uh, to 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 make sure that the um we're aware that the the uh, the uh, COVID uh, impact of COVID is still about us. So whatever we do, we have to make sure that um, we 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 do that in a safe manner. Um, we had a very successful uh, opening of the of the town centre back in August time. So we're trying to replicate some of that uh, in a way that we again ensure that the the hospitality, in particular in this case, can take advantage of the, of the the. Um, of the releasing of certain restrictions, but likewise we do it in a in a very safe manner. And I think Mike has got quite a bit of detail that he can share with us with regards to the specifics from the from the um, from the twelfth of April. Okay, thank you, Mark. Chair, chair, is it possible I could just put a couple of um, slides that I've done last night just online to illustrate some of these points? Of course, that's that's fantastic. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, just be a second. Um, Here we go. Just let just let me know when you can see those. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, so just really, I, I'll be I'll be brief. But um, in terms of a summary of where we are for April the twelfth onwards, um, the first principle is around uh, yes, welcoming people back to the town and the um, the reopening of non essential retail that is permitted from the twelfth of April, which is great news. Um, However, the first principle that we've adopted, as you would expect, is that that needs to be a safe return to trading, both for the, the stores and businesses themselves, um, but also obviously for, for residents, for, for visitors who are coming into the town um, and, and, and are going to use facilities. So in terms of safety and accessibility, um, you'll see um, we've extended the community ambassadors presence within the town um, initially through to the end of the June uh, end of June and then we're going to look at that again but that will play a key role really in in uh, advising supporting being a friendly face um, also there is an element uh, of course of um, uh, intervention there if you know if we've got groups gathering and and, and breaches of social distancing but um the primary purpose really is is a welcome host and a, a um 
uh, and, and really a supportive um, presence for uh, residents who are coming into town. Um, we are, we've taken part in a, a nationwide scheme around promoting um, uh, the needs around hidden disabilities, which is something we're committed to around improving accessibility in the town. Um, so there's a whole host of things that we're doing around that agenda, and that will roll out through the spring and summer, really, again, just to, to promote accessibility. Um, we are um, in the process of making some improvements around um, lighting, um, particularly on Duke Street and Houndgate. Um, some of this is driven around safety and perception of safety. Others are, uh, you know, there is another dynamic, I suppose, just around uh, cosmetically what that looks like. But certainly um, that area around Hangate particularly is, is something that we've had a number of queries and, and pieces of feedback on. And um, we're going to improve the lighting down there alongside the uh, alongside the businesses, the traders. Um, Mark's point around pavement cafes has been an awful lot of work going on around this and I've got another session on it early afternoon today so that we can get ready for the 12th. So what you'll see is what we rolled out last summer um, on um, Conniscliffe Road and Skinnergate where there was, you'll see that image of the white picket fence in there, uh, those images rather. We're going to replicate that um, on Connie, uh, Conniscliffe Road and, and Skinnergate and that will happen seven days a week from 12 noon through till 10 p.m. because obviously hospitality businesses are only allowed to trade outdoors from the 12th of April. Uh, potentially on the May the 17th they will be able to trade indoors hopefully uh, as well but what we we, we want to try and replicate this pavement cafe atmosphere and give um, businesses hospitality businesses the chance to start their recovery um, um, across the town. So that's what Conniscliffe Road and Skinnergate will look like. There's um, a num lots of other businesses across the town who uh, will trade outside from the 12th of April. And then, as I say, later today, I'm hopeful we've been working with um, Gordon at uh, DAD around um, another seven businesses where we can um, show some flexibility to get them trading on the pavement. Obviously, it's got to be done in a safe way. It's got to be accessible. Um, but we're hopeful that those variations will be able to agree those today. So uh, from the 12th, you should see lots of pavement cafe activity. We just need to order the weather. Um, in terms of business support behind the scenes, there's a lot of this been going on um, right through the most recent lockdown. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, business to business um, engagement through Andrew Perkins team and, and Sarah Travis has been lots of that going on. Um, uh, we've been working with a lot of the independents within the town to create a network amongst them. Um, the feedback I've had and I've sat in on a number of the sessions is that, um, that they felt a real value in that because this has been uncharted territory for obviously for all of us and finding, navigating their way through it and working with other independents um, around getting their businesses, um, getting their online presence improved, their click and collect improved, and also getting ready for reopening. There seems to have felt a real value in that. Um, there's been lots of stuff going on through social media around just profiling independent businesses. You'll see there the Love Darlo stuff around meeting traders, etc. Um, it's really just been about digitally trying to get everyone connected, supporting each other and creating networks within the uh, within the town centre business economy um, to support each other through this, this difficult time. Um, you'll see just some of the, um, what you'll see starting to go up this week um, in the town, getting ready for the 12th and that will accelerate next week. At the top of the screen there, you'll see lots, uh, the, you'll see a number of images about Welcome to Darlington and that spring feel in the background. We've deliberately done, we felt strongly that we needed a welcome back message. That is, I'll show you some other images because that is obviously tempered with the safety message quite rightly, but we felt that um, colour, spring, optimism was very much the order of the day for visitors to our town centre and we wanted to try and reflect that in the, um, uh, in the creatives there, in the designs.
Um, so you'll see some more examples just along the top, along the header there. Um, uh, our town centre manager, Alex, has done a, 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 an absolute pot full of work in terms of engaging with businesses at, at this time, not just businesses, but schools. You'll see an image there. I think we've got, uh, there was 25, 30 odd schools that have taken part in a, um, an Easter egg challenge where they've, they've made a class design of a giant Easter egg and those are now dotted around business premises throughout the town in shop windows um, so that there's a, a, a school's uh, Easter egg trail there that their artwork is is um, uh, is on show, which is lovely. There's more stuff going on uh, around trails, given that they're, they're a pretty COVID friendly way to um, support engagement during this time. So we're doing some of that stuff with the local illustrator, Liz Millian. I'm sure some of you know Liz. She's, she's done lots of work in the town over lots of years. And then we're working with the Flower Bombers and uh, uh, all the knitters who are do, going to do lots um, of little uh, mini creative installations for us across the town. Um, so just looking forward, um, we, we focus the animation of the town in the in the next six to ten weeks very much on um, uh, street theatre, roving entertainment, things that are not going to generate a crowd, a static crowd for obvious reasons. Um, so it will be very much around promenade performances and bringing colour to the town, uh, colour, some music um, and and just creating that warmth of welcome for, for residents who are coming into town. We're hopeful that um, that's going to morph into some smaller static performances and also we're going to do we're going to use the town centre as a as a platform to support the re-establishment of the hippodrome so i'm going to use that as a, um, a joseph P's place in midsummer um, around showcasing a number of the shows that we've got returning to the hippodrome in the autumn and into 2022 because we've got lots of West End shows that are uh, in the diary there. So we need to get out and remind residents that the Hippodrome is, is still here and a, and a, a fabulous venue. Um, we've then got plans for August and September for a return to some of our um, larger festivals and gatherings. Now, clearly that we've got, we're working closely with the police and that will need to be done as per the restrictions that are in place at that time and we just need to there's a, an element obviously of wait and see here so we've got we've got detailed plans a and b around what we would do depending on what restrictions look like but we're certainly hopeful that we can re-establish you know some of these major community engagement events and i've just showcased some of them at the bottom there um as we move through the summer i just need to obviously wait and see what the conditions are going to look like for us to be able to do that. Um, so appreciate that was a bit hurried, but um, would would gladly take any questions. No, th thanks, Mike. Uh, and you were able to pull that together last night. So I'm amazed. <laughs> thank you. Um, I've got Chris McEwen. Uh, thank you, Chair. The first thing to say is um, thanks, Mike, for that uh, presentation. And I know there's no I in team or, or an M and an E, and I know there's a team behind this trying to um, um, not just um, council, but but traders as well. So um, well done and uh, fingers crossed. And I, I, I'm going to make a comment and I, I want this to be seen as a constructive comment. There was a bit of turbulence last time and a bit of controversy. I, I, and I know great efforts were put into engagement. Uh, have you and Alex and the team sort of really try to push the engagement because I think it is critical that this is a real um, public and private partnership to coin the phrase uh, yeah. to, to get it running. Um, so, and I am confident that's the case, but I, I think the committee just wanted some assurance. But I'd also make a final comment, Chair, uh, to Mike. I think as members, we, we've got to get behind you and do what we can to uh, promote the fact that um, we will be open for business, uh, but it but in a safe way. So use use and abuse us as members to uh, promote what's going on. I would say, Mike, um, okay. and fingers crossed on a lot of this stuff, though. Um, 
Thanks, Councillor McEwen. Just on that first question there around um, engagement, Alex has done, an, and I mean, I know some of you know her within a, within a um, role as a town centre manager. The, the nature of the way she approaches it is um, absolutely based around people and engaging with business. And that has very, been very much on the ground, out and about in the town. Um, and then forming those networks around. So we've got a very clear network now around hospitality and all those businesses and their common interest. We've got around the independents and also through Susan at the Corn Mill and the, and the, and the Nationals. Um, by the nature of it, um, you, you're dead right. Um, we don't all agree on everything. There's different views about, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, how as a collective we approach things. However, I do, it does feel like there's a, a real groundswell of support for each other. I've seen that particularly with the hospitality businesses in the last three weeks when we've been navigating our way, way through the pavement cafe, um, the licensing process. Inevitably, some of the things that that throws up, because it's not, you know, it's, it's not as straightforward as just trading outside on the pavement, that, that inevitably means a knock on for all kinds of issues around traffic management, disability access, um, you know, uh, uh, being kind to your neighbour uh, and, and the rest of it, all of the things that um, inevitably come out. So yes, it won't be without its bumps in the road. Um, you're quite correct. But I, I feel like as a town, there's a, there's, a, there's a good, there's a real spirit of togetherness in terms of trying make this work from the 12th and chair if i may just add finally um i will seek to get some extra pass outs from mrs m um because she does limit them um but we'll see how that how that goes thank you councillor McEwen. well i think i think we've got a year's worth to to use for many of us haven't we so it's yeah. uh, okay we've got uh, anybody else want to ask any questions any comments? Okay. Chair, um, Chair, yeah. could I, Chair, could I make one more, uh, one more request, please? I um, and this is a, an unapologetic um, pitch for the for the Hippodrome as well. While we're on, so the Hippodrome, just for a members' benefit, there will reopen on May the seventeenth, as per the government roadmap. Um, obviously, getting re-established, like all theatres, is going to be a, a challenge, but it's going to be one that we're going to we're going to we're going to meet head on. Could you all please um, tell your friends, tell your families, advocate for the Hippodrome because it's such a fabulous venue for all of us in the town, and we've got to we've got to get back up the ladder. I'm sure all members will will make, uh, and as, as yeah, as soon as comms come out, I'm sure every single one of us will be spreading the the message on social media and telling our friends. And um, what what I believe anyway, it was uh, Councillor Tate mentioned it um, the the other day, is the the Hippodrome um, will also be holding weddings. Correct. Yep. So um, that that license is approved. So again, same message, please. As a function venue, wedding venue, function venue, the the uh, it it's not. It's, it's not just a stage, there's all kinds of Darlington College will return there uh, um, in terms of their, their regular teaching, performing arts programmes, so there's lots going on. Okay, thank you. Um, just just before I bring in Councillor Body, um, there's obviously talking about the, the, the town centre reopening here, but there are obviously also businesses uh, in the hospitality sector which are not based uh, within the town centre, but will have similar challenges. Um, I'm assuming we've been working with with all of those. I know that there's, there's one in particular in um, in the Brinkburn and Faberdale ward that you have been working with. Yeah, absolutely. And the and you know that some of the pubs on. Um, estates and in, in other areas outside of the town centre that bring some particular challenges um, which um, you know around trading outside and using car parks and things like that but licensing have been working with them closely so um, again what we're, tr we're trying to follow that government guidance around um, let's let's do things differently we, we this is a, a unique situation that everyone's been put in and, and we need some creative responses so uh, the licensing people have been working hard to try and do that thanks mike um bringing council body 
Hi, yes, I'd just like to congratulate you on all the work you're doing. As just one tiny thing, um, I think the theatre is called Darlington Hippodrome rather than just the Hippodrome. My parents always referred to it as the Hippodrome all the years it was the Civic Theatre as well. But it's a, uh, I think it's important that we, that we, if it is called Darlington Hippodrome, we use that, that correct name in all the literature. It, it's of less re relevance because of the way iPhones work now and they will naturally, because of your location, patch you into that business if you type Hipp Hippodrome. But I think for people perhaps coming from outside the area. There are other hippodromes in the UK. Oh, absolutely. It is Darlington Hippodrome, and it's, it's me, uh, it's me shortening it, which uh, my mother would tell me off for as well. You're dead right. I shouldn't be shortening anything. OK, thanks. Thanks, Mike, for that. Uh, OK, there's no more questions. Right, OK, we'll move on to agenda item number six, which is COVID-19 business support grants update and are we Steve's okay is he? I, I'm going to do the uh, the uh, COVID update. Oh, sorry, Andy. I'm Andrew Perkin here. Um, morning everybody. Um, as you'll be aware from previous meetings we've provided you with an update on the um, the status of the current uh, COVID business support grants that have been provided by government and we provided a report today really just to give you an update on where we're at with all of the various schemes that the council have been operating since the second national lockdown was introduced in early November. Um, you can see the headline from the sort of the report there that so far we've allocated more than 11 million pounds to Darlington businesses across a range of different schemes that uh, that have been operating. Um, since we last uh, uh, met in early February, the government have actually extended the national lockdown support to the 31st of March. Um, so again, there was a, a second uh, payment cycle for uh, a, a number of businesses to qualify for further grant support. Um, so far we've done almost 5,000, we've dealt with more than 5,000 applications um, for support in that period. So again, obviously interest has been you know, quite significant across the Darlington business community and where we can and where we've been able to, we've, we've, we've kind of provided the support based on those criteria. Today is actually quite a bit of a milestone because um, the government announced in the budget in early March that the, the lockdown grants would actually terminate on the 31st of March and an, a new period of grant support would be introduced called restart grants. Now these are actually, <coughs> these actually went live this morning eligible for applications. So it's moving to that phase that in some ways that my colleague Mike mentioned there where we're talking about how we we, we get back into uh, to, towards some normality, towards doing what we used to do, towards recovery. Um, so it's no longer about living in lockdown. It's actually about what are we doing to help businesses uh, with that recovery process. So uh, a scheme has been set up and provided uh, provides financial support to, uh, for various different sectors, including um, uh, accommodation, hospitality, leisure sectors, um, non-essential retail, um, as well as uh, gyms and uh, uh, and physical exercise uh, venues. So the, the scheme's just been launched, as I say, and we're, uh, we started taking applications. We've already had a number arrive this morning, uh, which is good. We'll be working obviously with the business community to get the message out there that funding is available for these areas and again linking to that final question on the previous item we'll be working with all the hospitality uh, venues the accommodation venues not just in the town center but to make sure that they're aware of that this support is available so we'll be we'll be we'll be looking to sort of what uh, I suppose commence um, uh, sort of publicity work and uh, get some social media uh, activities going. I think it's also worth pointing out that the existing um, local restriction grant schemes, the ones for lockdown, they've now been terminated. Um, so with one exception, um, the additional restrictions grant, all of the other schemes will actually close their eligibility from, well, from yesterday. So, uh, Councillor Hughes. Yes, thanks, Andrew. Um, I just 
Around the restart grant, so five billion pounds, it sounds an awful lot of money, but obviously that's nationwide. How much of that have we actually got in Darlington? Or how does it work? Do we take in the applications and then apply centrally for the money from government? Or do we have a pot of money within Darlington for these grants? There will be an allocation for Darlington. Um, I've not actually seen the, the actual figure. I don't know if Elizabeth has seen that um, uh, actual allocation of Darlington. But yeah, effectively, what we'll be doing, we'll, we'll be um, awarding grants and claiming uh, that money back from government. OK, um, if we can just... Um uh, let the discussion continue and we'll bring in questions um, after. Okay. We just want to continue there, Andy, please. Yeah, I think that really, I think that's probably the what summarises where we're at at this moment in time. We've, as I said, we've, in total, um, we've awarded more than £36 million of grant support since the pandemic's been in place to the Darlington business community. So I think it kind of, again, it's putting in perspective the kind of range of support that that has been allocated to the business community um, and again while ever the schemes are in place we'll continue to work to obviously maximize the take up in Darlington and make sure that you know businesses that can qualify uh, do get that support. Okay thank you. Um, thank you. Apologies members just having a, an issue with my headphone there. Okay um, if we bring in Councillor Renton Thank you, Chair. Um, as you said, with the deadline for application to the ARG having closed yesterday, I was contacted by a number of residents um, and businesses in the construction industry wondering why they were not entitled to anything. Um, and I think the confusion was made worse by the fact that other local authorities have allowed construction firms to claim. And I know this for a fact because a friend of mine uh, received nearly £14,000 on Monday for their construction business in Middlesbrough. Um, and although these businesses in Darlington were op operating, um, you know, they were drastically reduced um, because of site guidance uh, and this created drastic financial losses for the companies. So can you give me an indication as to why certain businesses were left out of um, our local authorities uh, criteria? And also, could we give any assurance that they can, you know, be rest assured that they may get help in the future? to put their anxieties and worries at rest? Um, yes, yeah, certainly I think the additional restrictions grant is the one scheme that hasn't closed yet. Um, so that's actually still open for applications. It's actually a discretionary pot of uh, funding provided to local authorities. And unfortunately, yeah, every local authority has kind of done a slightly different scheme with different priorities identified. So in Darlington, we've published seven different types of business sector, yeah. which were categorised as the priority, which, as you said, like construction, um, contract services, those were not included in that uh, that that list of sort of prioritised investment. I think the, the challenge every local authority's got is we, there is a limited set a, a limited fund, a li limited budget for the grant scheme, and it's how do we then prioritise which which sectors receive support and which do not. Um, but yeah, we, we set up a, 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 a those sector priorities to, to initially provide that support um, and we've reviewed the scheme on a number of occasions during the last three, four months to bring in additional sectors. So it's kind of dynamic, but again, the construction sector, I'm afraid, still, you know, it doesn't qualify for that ARG support at this moment in time. Uh, two, two additional questions, if you yeah. like, Chair. Um, firstly, are we expecting to um, dish out 100% of the grant money that we've been given by the government? Um, because if we don't, surely there will be businesses that say, well, if you've got money left over and you're giving it back to the government, why weren't we entitled? Um, and secondly, uh, do we see construction um, potentially being added in the future to any of these startup grants or um, first comment, yes, we, we intend to spend 100% of the funding of, for the very reasons you've pointed out. It would be it would be foolish to return any of that resource uh, back to central government. Um, at this moment in time, there's no plans to include the construction sector uh, in the ARG scheme. 
but again as i said we, it, we are always open to sort of review it and uh, if we if we get that 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 lobbying and that pressure we'll, we'll you know we'll look at what the op the options are and where we are with the actual funding profile of the arg resource okay thank you chair okay thank you councillor renton um we've got councillor body yes it was just a very short point on page 16 7e uh the returning to the standard rate in april 2022 uh, I was just wondering, is there any possibility or is there any leeway at all? Uh, this is a question for both Elizabeth and Andrew. Um, is there any way that, that there might be a, a revaluation in the town centre for business rates downwards uh, in the in the intervening time um, in, a, in an attempt to keep uh, business rates down permanently in the future? I, I can come in, Chair, if that's all right. Um, the, the local authority doesn't do the valuation on the rates. It's um, the central government valuation office, so it's not in our gift to change valuations on business rates. When is the next revaluation due? Do we know? I believe is it next next year. It's every three years they do one, isn't it? Um, I don't know if Anthony's still on the call. He probably isn't now. Actually, he'd be the yeah, one who, yeah. who knows that. Yeah, you're right. It is 2022. Oh, 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I've got Councillor Tate. Um, thank you, Chair. It was just to pick up on, expand on a question Councillor Renton asked about pots of money and any leftover going back to central government. Um, so for the support grants that have all now closed, was that the total amount of the pots? So we have used everything available and give it out to local business. The, the support grants that have closed um, were national government schemes where we were given national government allocations. Um, it, we haven't. We, we we've spent every penny that we can, um, and we've not we've not returned uh, any funding. The, the way it kind of works is that the government gives us eighty percent of the actual allocation. Um, to spend which we've achieved and anything above that 20% we then claim so we don't we don't unfortunately have money to return back to them what we have been doing though is obviously working with businesses to encourage them to make sure that they do claim and that those eligible businesses get claims into the right schemes um, as you know as you can see there there's been six or seven different schemes running uh, sequentially and it's been very confusing for many people every you know every, many businesses have struggled to kind of comprehend what am I eligible for so we kind of done a, a, a service to kind of just talk people through the different eligibility that they, we think they should be a, a, able to claim grants for okay thank you Trying to just maximize what they can get yeah Thank you, Councillor Tate. Um, I've got Councillor Doris Jones. Is that? It just came up and then disappeared. Um, Elizabeth, do you want to come in? Sorry, Chair, I've got my hand up. It's not meant to be there. Apologies. <laughs> right, OK. Um, I'm not entirely the Chair. Sorry, I have sent you a text, though. OK. Um, right, just, just a question for myself. So on the, on the ARG, we were saying um, earlier that the, the scheme closed on the 31st? No, that's not correct. Um, ARG is still live. It's the other local restriction support grants that have closed. Right, OK. Sorry, sorry for confusing no, you. No, 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 no. No, it's... Um, OK, so on the on the ARG, um, if you've already received help under one of the LRSGs, you're not entitled to make an application to the ARG? That's correct. ARG is for those businesses that have not been supported by the main national government schemes. OK. Thanks for clarifying that. So I can see that um, I went on the, the website last night and uh, it seemed to be updating and the, the, the restart grant has, has now gone live on the on the website this morning. Yes, that's right. We're now taking applications for the restart grant. Um, so hopefully we'll uh, um, start actually um, processing those applications and getting the funding out to business. Okay. Um, have we got some comms that are going out on that? Um, just, uh, you know, as before, as members, we'll, we'll do everything we can to get the message out. 
Yes, certainly there's a, there's a press release being prepared and that will be issued today at some point and then there'll be uh, a series of social media uh, posts relating to the uh, launch of the restart scheme. OK, um, we've got Councillor Tate, do you want to come back in? Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, just briefly, Anthony, what is the restart scheme? What can it be used for? The, the restart scheme um, is a scheme provided by government to support businesses back into local uh, to, to recovery. There, there's two elements to it. There's one for the non-essential retail sector that had to close um, during the lockdown, and there's an element of grant support for those businesses. Um, it's actually less than the other scheme because in, because in the government's words the retailers can open on the 12th of April and start trading from that point and there is less needed for them to go back into to being been trading successfully okay. the other element of the scheme is for the um, hospitality leisure accommodation um, and gym sectors and it's for those businesses which pay business rates um, and there's grants available up to eighteen thousand pounds. These are these are one-off grants. So there's whereas previously we've been rolling grants forward and various payment cycles, this scheme it's just a one-off grant. The idea behind the slightly higher values for this sector is that this sector will not be able to open as quickly or as in terms of the roadmap, it might take a little bit longer for, for those businesses to be able to open. And therefore, there's some support towards covering under them from the lockdown period from 1st of April to either the 12th of April or a future date, depending on when they can open. And then there's some support there, some financial support there to help them really any adjustments or any kind of activities they need to do or equipment they need to purchase to be able to trade successfully so we talked about for example pavement um yeah. pavement licenses and you know people trading on the street and for, you know can we help them buy furniture for example with that grant is a, a good example right okay just um will the sort of beauty industry be included in that uh the yes sorry like the hairdressers and it, beauty it, 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 and the that's close the question I'm going to get. <laughs> yeah, the close contact industry. So that's the beauticians, hairdressers, uh, nail technicians, etc. Yes. They, they they will be eligible for that, provided they have a business rate liability. Okay. All right. Okay. So to, to pay business rates. So somebody that sits with inside another salon that pays a rent to the owner, but not a business rate, they'll be excluded. They'll be excluded from this scheme. Yes. Right. Okay. And just to just to confirm, if they've had payments through any of the other schemes, they're still el eligible for this one? Um, the government have actually changed the eligibility criteria for this scheme. Um, they've actually widened it, so there's actually more business types that are eligible, uh, which is why we've having, we're having to do an application form. Right. Um, the, as officers, the original idea was we would just roll forward the grant based on the support we've given so far. But because there's now a wider eligibility, we have to put in place the application process. There's also different monitoring requirements that are, uh, are in place. So, um, so yeah, there is, there is an application form. Um, there are wider eligibility there, but again, it's still linked to obviously demonstrating you've got that business rate liability so th there are some businesses who didn't qualify for support on the old scheme but, yeah. but will get the restart scheme. Okay lovely thank you and just one last thing sorry to push the point but I think it's important is for them businesses that I've just highlighted that might be excluded from this scheme because they sit within a salon would you recommend that they apply to the additional restrictions grant instead because that's still open? Um, if they're not eligible for the restart grant, can they apply for the additional restrictions grant? And then obviously you can assess that and say actually are these eligible or not? What what we're actually looking at doing is putting in place a scheme to uh, mirror the national restart scheme um, because we recognise obviously it's unfair that if somebody rents space 
in another unit and doesn't have that business rates liability um that they would be excluded from that support and uh -huh. you know, every, every business needs support to restart so i wouldn't encourage them to apply for the arg at this moment because we don't have the ability to s support that but okay. we are we, we are looking and we are um considering how we could actually provide support to those businesses again you know, on the ARG scheme we've, we've had not, not, you know, almost a thousand applications now so we've, we've actually got quite a good profile of a lot of the businesses in the town right and, and most of the ARG applicants are the ones that don't have business rates right okay so 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 my message if I'm speaking to the person I'm thinking of is just to wait because there might be a different scheme coming out is it a might or is it a definite Anthony it, it's it's a might um but I think it's a case of if they've already had support from the ARG scheme yeah they, they, they don't need to do anything right if, okay. they've not, if they've not had an ARG support um then please contact us and uh we'll 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 we'll, we'll consider how we can support them both from the, the lockdown part of life and the recovery part. OK, lovely. Thank you. I think that's cleared that up. Thank you, Councillor Tate. Thank you, Andrew. Got any further questions? OK. Thank you very much for coming along, Andrew. Really appreciate it. OK, we're now able to move over on to agenda item number seven, which is an update on the, the Towns Fund. Um, are you picking up on this, Chris? Or Well, I'll make a quick introduction, Councillor Durham, if that's all right. It's, um, right. it's, it's almost like a standing item, this, that, that we, we've had, because it's quite an important uh, initiative to actually really bring bring the town back back to life. And it, and it, and it segues quite nicely with the the previous two reports. Um, members will be aware that we got a million pounds forward funding, which uh, Chris and his colleagues have been um, uh, uh, spending as quickly as we can. Um, and uh, we've made some, some, some really great strides, but I suppose we've come to a point now where we're actually going into the next phase of the Towns Fund, which is the, 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 the larger uh, capital in, in investment schemes. And, um, we just thought it might be useful if members were brought up to speed of what we've done so far, uh, the feedback that we've had, which is really positive, the engagement that we've um, we, we, we've we've managed to uh, achieve with the local businesses, where we we feel that we've developed a very positive uh, vibe with businesses, both in the yards and 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 uh, along Skinnergate, uh, and likewise we've we've managed to uh, bring forward a number of of um, of projects, which includes public Wi-Fi, which includes lighting, which includes aesthetics improvements to the yards, etc., and, and business support. Uh, and so and we just thought it would be useful, Chair, if members were brought up to speed with that. But likewise, what's coming in the future and some some, some of the real opportunities, but likewise challenges as ever of, of, of us really beginning to deliver the, the town's fund. So I'll pass over to Chris, Chair. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. Do you mind if I put up a presentation, Chair? Yeah. No? Please yeah. do so. Thank you. OK, is that on the screen? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. OK, so it's it's fairly brief, but obviously lots of questions in amongst it. As more quite as more quite rightly mentioned there, the million pound is sort of not quite completed out yet, but we've made good progress with that and we're stepping out into the wider schemes in various various different forms. So. so on the forward fund, and this is the million pound that we received last September. We've been doing the yards, lighting enhancements, Wi-Fi, and we've acquired a property in Northgate. So looking at the yards, we've got engagement there with business and property owners is is still ongoing we've had three three formal sessions or informal sessions um i was out there earlier this week looking at skinner gate and the yards and there was people out there setting the businesses up ready to get going again in april beginning of in april the 12th so it was good to be able to see them face to face uh, socially distanced face to face 
Um, listed building application we've had approved and we've now commenced works in the yards. Um, that'll continue, but it'll also take into con consideration the reopening on April the 12th to avoid any conflict and make sure we don't get in the way of the reopening process. So, a couple of doors there. There's probably been half a dozen or more doors put in now. So, these are the good quality hardwood doors that were put in there. These two are in um, Buckton's yard. So you can see they're, they're quite impressive. There's lots of different colours. This one's probably the brightest, um, but we've got a there's a there's another lighter pink one. There's a there's a green one. Uh, they, they make a fantastic difference. Whereas before you'd you'd walk past a scruffy old door, and now these things leap out of you. And uh, even a few doors down the yards are, are changing the the feel. And the the person who owns this building here, the pink one. She was on site when I was down there and she was ecstatic about getting a, just a door into the building. It was it was amazing. So there's a lot of work going on in the yards uh, to, to tidy it up and that will continue. Light enhancements. So this went well, really well. We've, we've now lit up the clock tower. We've, we've relit up P statue. The benches and the planters, we've done the benches, uh, the, sorry, we've done the planters, the benches, we're getting replacement benches and then they'll be lit up underneath once once that's in place. And we've completed the enhanced lighting down on St Cuthbert's Church as well. So the next slide was taken a couple of nights ago. I wasn't down there, but I was sending two or three photos and, and this shows that you can see the light shone onto the face, which is now coming from um, the trough, from the the street lights. There's there's lights shine onto the face, rather than be fixed on there, so less intrusive. The lighting around the the bigger arches lower down, the colours can be changed there. Anything from white, red, purple, uh, any colour. I think these ones stay white. And then the clock face as well can be changed. So lots of opportunity there to tie into to various things that might be happening um, as we go through the year. Central, so the town centre Wi-Fi, uh, the, the central area, which is really the area around High Row and around, excuse me, High Row in the marketplace that should be live from today. I know Open Reach were in the data centre yesterday, so hopefully if all went well, we've got a, a brief, simple landing page which has been developed, and there should be a live Wi-Fi in the town centre today. I don't know for certain, but that was the the programme. We're not far off. That will extend into. The next area, the, the prioritised area of prioritised Skinner gates in the areas where the, the cafes are going to be, the street cafes. So tying in with that, I've been working alongside Alex on, on a lot of the work I do in the town centre. And really it's trying to get that so you can sit down and you've got free Wi-Fi when you're sitting there having your, having your drink or food. The next one. I've just seen a comment there, an email sent through from Councillor Tate. Thank you. I haven't seen the the end result of the of the church yet, but I'm, I'm I've just sure think, it looks I've included two pictures on the email, Chris. I don't know if oh, you want excellent. to share them because I think it's the best one in the town at the minute. Like, all right. Um, can I pick it up at the end and bring them up, and rather than lose myself in it? But that, I mean, the St Cuthbert's Church. It, it went really smoothly. It's quite a complex process going through all the diocese and getting it approved. There's been real buy-in, and I think there's an opportunity there now at this minute in time to the church are really on side, and it's to bring them into the into the town and into the market. So looking at opportunities, what we can do there. So yeah, really pleased with that. And I must say that the designers, the installers, and our capital projects team have really worked well in bringing these all together. They're fairly low value, but in terms of resource and getting them done, it's quite quite complex. So just moving on to the, the, the town deal 
proper, if you like. It's the the 22.3 million that we've, we've accepted and we've signed, and we've got the nine intervention projects. I've got a list further on just to, that we can sort of recap, and it helps me every time as well. So in terms of where we are, you've seen this before, we've, we've prioritised the projects on the 15th of Jan, we've got the heads of terms in place. We've just received some additional capacity funding that we, we had to uh, apply for. We applied for the, the maximum of uh, 120, we received 70, which through speaking to, to colleagues around the country and consultants around the country, that's more than most authorities got actually. A, a lot of authorities received 40, so we've done quite well getting 70 which will go into the pot to help us deliver and resource the, the tenants fund going forward. So this still stands and this is where everything is heading to at the minute from, from our perspective. We've got to develop the nine business cases and produce the summary documents that go to, to central government and that's within 12 months. So the, the, the backstop date on this is end of October. We're looking at really trying to get them in in two tranches possibly the, the earlier, easier ones, if you like, we might look. It's a fairly ambitious date, end of July, but let's see, end of July, hit August, if we get the first tranche in, and then the next tranche will be sort of end of September, with a month's grace if we need to, to the, to the back end of October. There's some good news there with the Adult Learning Project, which is the, the, the partnership that we're in with Darlington College where we're looking at tying that in to the, to the Northern Equa building. We've, we've, because of the needs and the, the real, with the, the desire to push on after COVID, really it's trying to get that on as fast, on stream as fast as possible. So we've put that in, uh, we've put a summary document in to, to central government and we've been awarded the, the 575K, which is possibly the first real towns fund money that's been awarded across the country. We're right at the front of the queue there in that 575. Um, I don't know that for sure, but it's certainly the first summary document that the towns fund support have looked at was ours, which went through no issues. We still have to do a business case, a full business case for that. It was put through fairly, fairly quickly. So just very quickly looking through each of each of the nine interventions, the RHQ Real Heritage Quarter has one. There's the, the Real Heritage Quarter team are put, putting together the, the business case for that to TVC at the minute. Once that business case is, is signed and completed, we'll then turn that around and it'll become a Towns Fund business case as well. So it'll, it'll have a different emphasis and there'll be things that we are specifically targeting within the Towns Fund. T-Levels, my next action on that um, is, the, is to meet up with the principal at the college, who's also on the Towns Board, so she's very much on board, and develop that into more than a concept and take it into, fees, into, into initial design, develop up the costs a bit more and really develop the business case. So relatively simple in terms of a business case. Victoria Road, I paid a site visit with Alex uh, Nicholson a week or two ago. We spent a couple of hours looking up and down the streets and um, seeing what was happening, seeing what was going on, looking for opportunities. So uh, I need to write that up and explore where we want to go with that. It'll be a combination of shop fronts, possibly acquisitions trying to complement the work that's been done with the, with the fantastic highway scheme and the work that will happen at the bank top in, in front of the portico. So it, the, 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 the likelihood is that be, the plan is, is back end of this month, about four or five weeks time, we'll hold the first initial consultation with um, businesses and residents owners up at Victoria Road in a similar way to what we've done in the yards. Peace House, we, of the four buildings, we've now acquired one of them. I uh, have been in it, inside, and I know there's quite a bit of interest to get inside from um, the Northern Echo and from the, the friends of the Stockton and Darlington Railway, etc. There's not an awful lot to see at the minute. It's upstairs have been fairly well stripped out. It's dry. It's solid. 
the downstairs is still is a bit nasty. It's 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 a pizza house still. Lots of grease, lots of dirt needs to be cleaned out and we can have, but it's it's quite an important building, the one we've bought. I think the historians are suggesting that that building, the one we've bought, is the is the place where Pease and Stevenson first met. Um, so in in the back room of the of the pizza house, I think is where they used to hold meetings. So there's there's quite a bit of history there, which we'll we'll learn. Linear Park. I've started gradually changing the name on that. The Linear Park is really the Skern Valley in the back of North Road. We're getting a master plan has been developed for that uh, by our consultants along with the heritage plan. Some fantastic stuff coming out of that in terms of um, short term, medium, medium by medium, I mean up to 2025 and long term even. It'll take a long time to develop that whole area, but there's fantastic opportunities really up there. At a learning we talked about before in the in the Echo Building. It's gonna get in the yards. So what's happening there? We've had one meeting on March the eleventh, uh, which was well attended, and it was really an introductory meeting to potential changes of the highway, potential changes and in, in, uh, enhancements to the to the properties themselves, and also looking at the residential scheme that's ongoing there. So it, it was an introductory. Now that'll split into three. We'll do the engagement on the highways in a similar way to the way it was done on Victoria Road. We'll do the engagement with the properties and ancillary bits up, up the edges in a similar way to what we've done along the yards. So I met, when I was walking up and down Skin again, there was two, three, four businesses that I had a, had a word with as we're walking up there. So there's lots of interest with, with various businesses already. Bank top in a similar similar way to RHQ that will tie in with the project that's going on at Bank top. So really, it's keeping in touch with my colleagues in in capital project team and, and link to that. Make sure it goes forward. Northgate House in North Road. Again, quite complex areas. Northgate House, we're, we're in the process of um, starting a development plan there. Uh, alongside it with the private um, owner of the of the land adjacent to Northgate House, we don't know on Northgate House at the minute, but we're progressing with the the plans and the development plans to take that forward. North Road, very complex area. Um, again, it'll be looking at opportunities. And that that is one. Of, there's a lot of engagement going on around and within North Road, but really I need to leap into the North Road area. There's various things going on up there. Like I've I've met the school and I know I've got a meeting with Councillor Hawk next week actually and looking at a, at a tiny forest opportunity up linking with the school, potentially up at the at the north end of the site. So lots going on and lots to be done. So this engagement of talked about a lot of this already on there. I think I've covered on the last slide. Likewise, so it's, at the minute, it's all about engagement and project development. Some projects need more development than others. Like Skinnergate, um, my visit, spent three hours down there yes, yesterday, the day before. Um, and the, the, there's obvious opportunities there, some easy, some not so easy, but we need to explore them all. We've talked about the various ones here, and that's the end of my slide. So I'm going to try and find the pictures you sent, Councillor Tate. Okay, it's the first time I've seen this as well. Wow. They were taken last night, so from both angles, they look really good. That's the picture from the road and from the fire station, and even the one from the town market square, they look amazing. That's fantastic, isn't it? It's jumping out now. That's really good. So what it's going to give, particularly from the market square, it's... I wanted to create a backdrop and create a backdrop to the market square when it's dark, which I think that does. Now that's really good. Thank you for them. I'll share them with all members if you want them. 
Please, Councillor Turp. Okay, so happy for any questions or I'll... Okay, we'll open up to the floor. Thanks for that, Chris. Um, I've got Councillor, Councillor Body. Yes, I just wanted to ask. Well, make comment really in your in your full business in your full business case for your adult learning program, will there be uh, safeguards included in that in relation to auditing the services provided, uh, and then in relation to um, the Rail Heritage Quarter? I know I've gone on about this a lot in meetings, and I'm sorry for repeating myself, but uh, is there any provision either in that or in capital projects? for uh, perhaps a statue of George Stevenson or a statue of Robert as well. I happen to know that the statue of Robert outside Euston Station has been put into storage by rail track and uh, and it's it, and they're, they're, they're looking to to lend it out while they don't need it. Uh, and so we might be one of the people who might be eligible to to borrow that from them for as long as it's free. Uh, and. Uh, uh, costs allowing, of course. I mean, who knows how much it costs to move that around. But um, uh, I've also done some preliminary work into the cost of buying our own statues in bronze of George and Robert Stevenson. Obviously, that would have to be put out to public tender if, if we were to go down that road. But uh, it might be something that we want to include in the Rail Heritage Quarter plans. In, in terms of the in terms of the first one about safeguarding, yes, of course, I think the exact position we're at on that project at the moment is the next step, so to to bring all the stakeholders, well, to get a design out on the ground floor, and then to bring all the stakeholders together. There's been an awful lot of interest on on this and people that want to be involved, and it's all of the. the the people, the people you would expect, the career service, Darlington College, our own learning and skills people are very interested in being involved, Northern Echo themselves. But you're right, there's there's a safeguarding issue in there. If you've got a if you've got a mixed area with a lot of different people using it, it needs to be considered. So yes. In terms of the statue and the real heritage quarter, I know Mike's still on the is Mike Crawshaw still on the call as he I think he's gone. Mike is closer to the real heritage quarter than I am. He's included. He's, in, he's involved very heavily with the with the project team, whereas I'm not. Um, I do speak to Mike about it, but it's certainly something which, yeah, it's. I would hope they're considering, and particularly if there's a nice statue down there in Houston, it seems like an opportunity that should be talked about and looked at. But from my perspective, but I'm not the project lead on that. So. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Body. I've got Councillor Tate. And um, thank you, Chair. It was just to pick up on um, Victoria Road and the enhancements that have already been done there. The streets looking a lot nicer um, in regards to the road and the public realm area. Um, one comment I have had from a resident, though, is um, that some of the shop fronts are now looking a bit tired um, and run down. Um, so I'm glad that you touched on that when you gave us the update that shop fronts might be next to maybe have a bit of a facelift. And I yeah. hope we can have some sort of theme through the street to make it look a bit nicer and make it flow well, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And, um, you know, it's certainly the, the time I spent the, a couple of weeks ago I've got a fairly clear picture in my mind now of the area which needs, if you're walking up the hill, it's the area on the right, just past the, the, the pub that's painted grey. Those properties look particularly worn. Um, and then there's a two or three or four dotted around on the other side as well. And there's some empty ones. Uh, I think there's some good opportunities in there and up and down that street. Um, the, the, the town's funding is only 600,000. It's fairly low on that. But if we can supplement that with something, some other source of funding, we'll be looking at that as well and see what we can do on the street, will you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. I've got Councillor uh, McEwen. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'll have to be brief. I need to, um, you don't say this very often, I need to join a call with some people in Ghana shortly. Um, <laughs> As mayor, long story. Um, seems to be some uh, great work. Uh, the lighting looks uh, great. 
Um, whilst we've got to focus on real heritage, I, I am joining a call uh, about Arthur Wharton, and I think there's a push to get some memorial to Arthur, given he was the first black footballer. Um, so whilst we've got an understandable focus on real heritage, there are other aspects um, that we need to celebrate in our town, but um, I just I, I throw that one in. And um, finally, uh, I'll put something in the chat. My mother is an artist and I've commissioned her to do some work around um, the 200th anniversary of the Act of Parliament on the 19th of April, uh, 2021. So it's 200 years since that Act of Parliament was passed and I'll put something in the chat, but she's done a bit of a collage and there's a bit of a sneak preview because she has um, put in the uh, the collage, the uh, pizza, the kebab shop. I'll just throw that one in. Okay. Oh. So anyway, I'll have to go because I've got to dial into a call in Ghana, which I've never done in my life. But uh, <laughs> wish you luck. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Do you want to come in on any of that, Chris? Yeah, I, th I thought on on the two hundred. I thought it was going to comment there on the 200th anniversary of the meet, the first meeting of um, Pease and Stevenson in that in the building. Now I know that um, the Northern Echo have showed an interest in being in say uh, having a look inside that house, and I know there's a potential meeting on the 9th of April that I'm trying to coordinate and make sure that everybody's kept informed, in including. Councillor McHugh in there as well, obviously with the with his interests in that. And whereas to dive it, we're set the, the town's board has has been sat there for some time now, and we're in the process of trying to set subgroups up. One of the subgroups is heritage and culture, and it'll focus on the Peace House and RHQ and one or two of the other projects are very clearly heritage focused. And what I became aware talking to the chair of the of the town's board was Darlington, quite rightly, is very focused on, on the Real Heritage Quarter and also the Quaker Heritage, but there's more than that line beneath it. And I think what we've done is I've approached um, a lady from the, the Weaving Rooms up in, who runs a, a business up to the north of Darlington to bring in some of the, the sort of the mill and the, the, the textile history as well and just create a bit of diversity in the in the culture and the heritage group. I think it'll create a, little, a nice balance within there. So it, it is a good point that was made there about the, the diversity. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Um, have we got any anybody else wants to come in, ask any questions? Okay. No. Just just one one thing, Chris. It's obviously um, we we've had obvious restrictions as a, as and when we start to to move through the various phases of reopening. Um, I think it'd be great if um, if members were able to uh, attend some field trips just to get a feel for the direction of travel that you've got on these mm. various schemes. Mm. I would love that. I'm always happy to to walk around and um, I enjoy talking about them. So I'd be more than happy to do that if I want to do that. Yeah, look forward to that. Thank you. OK, well, thank you very much for, for that update. Um, thank you. If we're able to move on to agenda item number eight, which is broadband infrastructure in Darlington. Um, and this is an update, um, I believe is it Jock is in the room. He was in the room, Chair. I'm in the room, yeah. I'm in yeah. the room. But uh, I let's let Mark here start here, put a nice interlude in. <laughs> okay, and then I can, can, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try my best, Jochen, yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is just a, a, an update for members as regards to uh, broadband infrastructure and rollout. Clearly, there is... Um, Part, parts of the town are well served. Unfortunately, that's not a consistent message, in particular in, in, some, in some of our villages, but likewise in some pockets of the town as well. And so what Jochen has, 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 has drafted here is just a briefing paper for members to give them a feel as regards to what is currently uh, available, both um, in, within the town itself and, and, and the various um, communities and, and, and estates, and that the, there is a real commitment for any, any new uh, bill to have the access to, um, you know, uh, uh, 
quality broadband. But likewise, uh, in this month, uh, there is also a rollout for voucher schemes uh, within the rural areas, which, as as members will be aware, have not had the probably the greatest of of, of coverage when it comes to uh, broadband accessibility. So I'll pass over to to Jochen to give you the detail behind this this particular briefing note, Chair. Thank you, Matt. Right, I try and out here the very crucial part. Yeah, well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <clears throat> broadband infrastructure and especially here, yeah, well, uh, the upgrade of uh, speeds within yeah, well, Darlington has been an issue for quite a long time. Uh, where we currently sitting here is yeah, well, a step change from a second program uh, by government, which ran until 2021, and the new program to come up here yeah, well, from 21 to roughly absolute, well, absolutely uh, related to 2030. So it's about a decade long program. Uh, different different funding mechanisms have been utilised for that, and uh, the governance of this programme have been here particularly uh, complex in our area. Until 16, we as a local authority funded directly here, public sector funded you know, initiatives for broadband. Since 2016, that is here, well, basically uh, supported by TVCA for the whole of the Tees Valley. So the first chapter is basically the current uh, schemes which are running at the moment and uh, uh, the most uh, uh, financially viable one at the moment is certainly the commercial rollout which is done in Darlington by two providers by Openridge and Virgin Media. Uh, so that is something where we as a council have no control over because they did that commercially sensitive and they're very pretty aware uh, that they don't give any intermediates an insight uh, where they're actually delivering. The second point here, uh, it's point B, is the public funded uh, program, which we uh, are embedded into the program with uh, Digital Durham or, or the Durham County Council, which looks at the program area, which also includes uh, Sunderland, Gateshead, North and South Tyneside, County Durham and Old Tees Valley Authority. Uh, in terms of size of the intervention, well, we're looking at hundred thousands of pounds here, not like the millions which we had before. Uh, this was geared up here, well, uh, through uh, TVCA, which basically get, got here, well, uh, into uh, the state where we as a local authority identified areas which were not well covered and they were mostly in rural areas. The third example here in terms of the core current broadband infrastructure initiatives is basically something we did as a council ourselves, or I did myself with uh, Councillor Lee for the Western villages here in uh, Darlington, which have been constantly overlooked here since 2012. And that's uh, an intervention to get a, a broadband provider about providing here, well, infrastructure by uh, rural gigabit voucher vouchers which is the old kind of subsidies which runs out this year uh, to look here for gigabit enhanced uh, well provision here or uh, within the center uh, of the no-go area and i will show you later a map here well uh, how i see that is uh, well uh, developing uh, where we can actually bring something here to the smaller villages of killerby summer house and denton but have possibilities provider who basically applies for the residents for these vouchers, installs them, and uh, basically they have to pay a monthly fee like everybody else in the town as well. So that is a, a provider called Quickline. Why we chosen Quickline is because they have been here a very good uh, a rural provider and uh, substantial uh, credentials and uh, palmares. Uh, they come in here from uh, from the Yorkshire region, but they have been working recently here with uh, bigger contracts from North Yorkshire, Lincolnshire, East Riding, and they certainly have got the credibility of providing rural solutions. Coming down to the second thing, so this is the, the, the third step program of government here, which is the project Gigabit, as, as I call it. 
that uh, started in earnest really only this year and uh, uh, that is also here yeah, well currently rolled out here yeah, well on the procurement area basis and what we heard here yeah, well uh, some two weeks ago is yeah, that uh, digital durham here yeah, will be the lead body here yeah, for an area which includes yeah, uh, more vumberland uh, county durham gates and sunderland south tyneside and the tees valley local authorities as well the aim of this program that is the big number big ticket number five billion uh, of uh, gigabit enhancement is basically foreseen for the 20 percent here of the most marginalized areas and this first procurement area is uh, certainly until 2025 and uh, it is based on areas which currently don't get any uh, faster speeds but it will enhance uh, the speed level from super fast, which was 25 gigabits, megabits here yeah, to uh, well one gigabit areas as well or capability. Um, what is clear now that Durham, the Durham area, as one of the first in the bunch, you have been here well declared the procurement area, and they will be looking from May this year for a procurement deliverer for these rural 20 percent based on the principle which they called outside in because it's the most marginalized one of the the areas which are harder to reach and also here well uh, on the level that they are not uh, economically feasibly or marketable here well, to be reached by the normal commercial road out second point is here that uh, the new rural that there will be a new rural gigabit voucher scheme as well. That is here basically for providers via residents here to apply, which can be grouped and pool themselves. That's a new program which has not been released yet, but is expected that the guidelines come out here well in April this year. And uh, in terms of a little bit of sourcing, who could provide here? Well, I had here well uh, the chance to speak directly here to different kind of uh, charges on the on the level of uh, rural broadband rollout here well in, uh, in in the UK and there are different candidates there but it's a little bit like second hand car dealers whatever they promise the world and they're very good in selling uh, but what it actually sits behind it that's something you have to evaluate and uh, on some of the issues, you basically find investment banks here from London here behind it here with uh, uh, with the purpose here of uh, well basically uh, well yeah investing and and, and making profit. Um, the third phase of that here is the commercial rollout and retrofitting of uh, broadband here, which we had already. I said here about a step change. What we have done here, well, in, in, in Darlington until now, well, we reached a super fast level of speed. We've seen for the pandemic here, well, that the take up here of uh, virtual means is in, increased. Uh, and, uh, well, the need for speed, certainly on the digital thing, in terms of uh, multiple usage of devices here on uh, Wi Fi and internet, uh, needs to be here, well, uh, uh, enhanced significantly. So we've got a residue level of some areas within Darlington which sit on the BT open reach up to 80 megabits sector. We want as much as everybody else to get them uh, to a higher speed. That is a, again a commercial selective process of these providers at the moment and uh, they're not sharing that necessarily with TVCA, Digital Durham, or uh, nor with the council. Um, however, we try to lobby uh, new providers to come in who can actually then here uh, uh, pretend to be a competitor to these uh, established ones, uh, which we have Open Reach and Virgin Media. Virgin Media's network actually is classified and defined as gigabit enabled because it can handle up to one gigabit where some of the uh, fiber fiber to the cabinet uh, 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 well technology which goes via telephone lines to the households well they are not so 
there is still quite a lot of areas to retrofit and that sits at the moment in terms of the capital decisions with board, board decisions with open range at this stage. However, we uh, well also looked at, at different providers which could do and who are interested in our region or basically came from the south to the north and I want to mention one of them but mention another as well. I, I cannot hear. City Fibre is certainly engaged here within the northeast region here in Newcastle, Sunderland and has been starting to put investments into our neighbouring towns like Middlesbrough and Stockton and red care uh, they have been here some some uh, have had here because here some initial meetings here well how they can actually enter the market here but uh, we're doing the same with giga clear we're doing the same with uh, kcom whatever but they have got different investment decisions to make and on top of that here yeah, well we work in here with tbca who's got the digital group uh, set up and uh, want to publish I think this year a digital strategy for the uh, uh, Tees Valley as well uh, which looks at utilization training but uh, in most cases here as well of the infrastructure provision here which is in the digital sector which then also goes into the uh, 5G application which is then the, the, the more mobile version of broadband. That's where I want to stop. I hope I haven't baffled you with uh, acronyms here too much. Or, well, I couldn't do any joke because it's after the time of the first April joke time, I think. But uh, any questions? Thank you, Topin. All right, have we got any questions from the floor? Okay, I've got Councillor Harker. Thank you, Chair. I mean, it, it's not really, it, it's a question, but it's a comment on some of the things that Jochen has been talking about. I mean, my personal view is that, that, that uh, this sort of infrastructure should not be um, a mix of private and public sector. Um, I mean, Jochen's clearly identified some of the issues that he's facing, trying to plug the gaps. If, you know, commercial companies, and I fully understand this given the circumstances we're in, aren't, don't need to necessarily reveal where they're working in. And clearly, as we've seen before, they all go for the areas that bring the highest return in their investments. But it is mad that that we're left with this situation where, you know, and it's clearly, as I highlighted at the beginning, many of the rural villages just don't get a look in because presumably the bigger companies don't won't turn the profit that they can make in the bigger towns. And really, just to make the point that the infrastructure, even if the services that sit upon them are private, the infrastructure should be done by the public sector to make sure that all citizens get fair access to um, something that's becoming increasingly essential in modern day life and employment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Harker. Do you want to come in on that, Jochen? Uh, well, absolutely true, and it's uh, often a very uh, well non-transparent field for it. And uh, certainly, we as a local authority here, well, who tries to provide in some ways, you know, well, services here to the citizens, uh, sometimes, you know, well, it's certainly very nebulous for us here, you know, well, where investments are made on on what basis. What I put up here is here basically a plan here you know, from uh, the our local plan which is the infrastructure investment plan which we have, which looks at the state of play uh, roughly at the, the, uh, the, the year 2018, uh, where our gaps are. The white areas are principally our gaps, which uh, mostly the rural areas, which haven't got any of the 25 uh, uh, megabits here, uh, well, uh, speed, which, they, which uh, the, the sector calls super fast. Uh, we can now on the, the, the level of ultra fast, which is 100, 100 megabits plus, and developing into the area that gigabit here will be here, well, the benchmark here. In principle, the areas are still the same, and the areas which we wanted to take forward, the red areas with TVCA fundings, uh, people will see. Uh, well, lots of areas. That was our initial proposal here for TVCA to calculate if that is possible to do with the money pot we had, which was about one million 
uh, for the whole Tees Valley Authority, so that would be five. Uh, some areas have been confirmed of investment areas uh, because, uh, well, we're still in the pro process here of delivering them and uh, uh, they're still commercially sensitive because BT can sell their network on to other providers. Uh, I cannot really tell you 100% where they are, but what I can say is that about 60% yeah, of the areas which we've got on the map uh, are likely to be done here with, uh, 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 well, within the next three months by June uh, 21. I know it's a complex map, map, map and uh, if you go into uh, separations of speed, uh, uh, for the town center, you see see different different evaluations. But in terms of provision for uh, ultra fast or or gigabit, we've got here three big masts in within our territory, and then to have areas which don't have anything at the moment, uh, while they're not here, yeah, well heavily populated, I think here, yeah, well we should make any efforts here, yeah, well to get them covered as soon as possible. And uh, I hope you're yeah, taking initiative on on some of the issues is a good thing because then we can document that uh, well uh, we can actually do something here yeah, for ourselves. Uh, but also then using here hopefully any external funding available here from uh, uh, other bodies as well. Okay, um, I can I can well just just one one comment while I'm here. You can obviously see from this map and um, the areas that are that are in white, um, which which you know. Um, Parts parts of the 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 urban landscape of Darlington, um, you know, there's housing developments. If we, you know, talk about Milton St George, and there's housing developments up here at uh, on on West Park. Um, you talked at, right at the very beginning about um, the housing developments and um, how they should be connected to um, at least the super, super fast broadband, but um, the, the the gigabit rollout is that the case? Uh, there is a step forward on that, yeah, and we certainly had a, had a look at that here yeah, with the uh, government there. I mean, new built estates yeah, over a certain amount of uh, 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 houses yeah, need to be now uh, gigabit enabled. And the developers, well, have done that, yeah, well, uh, uh, in contact, which we normally provide here yeah, to uh, the developers uh, in, in, in uh, well, relatively good uh, percentages so that for the future developments I don't think there's an issue because it also here yeah, well eats into here yeah, the sellability of uh, properties for the developers as well so the new uh, estates or the larger estates they are not not really here yeah, the, the the ones here yeah, who have the bother uh, developers uh, well actually going here now the mile of take talking to the infrastructure providers to get here the ducting into place. It's the ones here which have been developed and we had several of them here in Darlington in the late 2000 or early 2010s where the developers totally forgot here well to look at uh, broadband speeds here at all as, a, as an issue of a locational factors for residents and uh, some of the areas well we have tried very hard to retrofit even with our own initiative or uh, through the public sector funds. Uh, it is the step change going now from super fast to giga, gigabit enabled where, for example, in West Park, uh, people say the new houses here well uh, built here at the moment uh, by the four developers, they will have, all have gigabit uh, enhanced uh, speeds, where the old West Park, for example, only has up to 80. And uh, yes, it is it is something which we raised with the uh, 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 <coughs> infrastructure providers and uh, where we basically going forward uh, with them and asking them, well, who does it first? But in fact, it's the only a decision here from, uh, from a, a financial and viability point of view of them. And when that is happening, 
uh, that is mostly always the place after they've done bigger concentrations you know, probably elsewhere in the northeast or in Yorkshire. But there's certainly on that level new estates uh, of a particular sites there they will be covered. Okay. Answer Councillor Tate. Um, it's not a question really, it's just a comment. Obviously I sort of work in this industry so know a bit more. Um, ultimately I think this whole pandemic has shown that having good speeds to one be able to work for home or run a business is pretty much a postcode lottery because it's dependent on where you live. Um, and one thing that's important as well is for the next phase of 5G for Darlington as well, that's going to be dependent on full fibre rollout because it can't run until that's completed and that's why we haven't got it yet um so yeah and just in regards to new build properties i remember when we on the planning committee when we did the planning development for nation roads that was one of the things we confirmed that was being put in instead of having to retrofit for the ducts for super fast driver thank you thank you councillor uh, councillor harker you put your hand down now Yes, it was up in error. Sorry, Chair. OK, um, I just um, is cabinet member Councillor Keir, um, is he still still in the room? I don't know if you wanted to come on and um, add anything to what Jochen has, has talked about. Yeah, I think um, Jochen explained it pretty well to, to Councillor Harker's point. I agree with you totally. We've got the the ludicrous situation, if you take the analogy of a railway, for example, we've got areas where we have um, BT having their set of lines and we've got um, Virgin Media with their set of lines and there the twain will meet. You know, it's a, there, there is um, definitely something that we're doing there. I'm, I'm working through that with Councillor Marshall and with the officers to see how we can we can try and leverage that as much as possible. And obviously, uh, Jochen's also um, looking at um, other providers as well to try and get some leverage there, because to be perfectly honest about it, I think the performance of BT open reach and how we've been, um, in Darlington in particular, how we've been dealt the cards that we've been dealt has been pretty abysmal. And I think that's something that we need to try and rectify over the future. So. Um, Absolutely, I think we, we have to be um, using whatever leverage we can to try and get that infrastructure part of it um, firmed up and keyed. Big problem, as Jochen says, is the commercially sensitive stuff just leaves us blind with a lot of that. And it's really a situation that we're trying to leverage as much as possible and try and get more transparent. But I'm quite sure even Councillor Harker would, would you, you, know in the industry, you know how, just how blind to try and keep you because it is commercially sensitive but I think um, the, the, the the outlook with the new um, outward to inward um, putting the emphasis on the uh, rural areas should drive some different thinking and we just need to maximize that as quick as, as much as possible and um, so we can bring that in and if we can use commercial leverage um, with other companies other than BT OpenReach to give alternative um, means of getting us that gigabyte capability then we, we should we should look at that so I think that's the sort of attack that we're going to be taking in the next um, sort of a year just to see what those opportunities are and how we can do it and Jokin's working really hard to try and figure out what what area needs what, what area's got what and see how we can we can, we can match that. Thank you, Councillor Keir. Um, and as and when those those plans start to develop, I'm um, hoping that you can go, come back to this committee uh, and, and update us with those. Have we got any further questions? Any comments? Okay. Well, thank you very much for for coming along today uh, and explaining the situation. Um, I think all members here uh, are as frustrated um, as obviously what you are. Uh, we're, we're frustrated on behalf of residents because it is a, it's, it's a common thread. Thank you. Okay. OK, um, if we move on to agenda item number nine, which is the work programme um, report of the managing director, and uh, just bring in Shirley. Thanks, Chair. 
Uh, the report at this stage of the year, really the work programme report is more a backwards look about what you've actually, what the scrutiny committee's done over the year. Um, if you look at Appendix 1, apart from the reports that have been on the agenda this morning, the majority of the items have been moved to the archived items, which is obviously what you would expect. It's really up to the committee um, first meeting the next municipal year to decide what it wants to put through on its work programme for next year. But the archived items will still be brought forward. Um, some members are aware if they want to continue with any of those items that they will be there on the work programme as a basis for your discussion. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Shirley. Um, I'll open it up to the floor. Has any members got any comments or questions? OK, Councillor Harker. Thank you, Chair. Um, Shirley's possibly answered the question I was going to ask. It, there's a couple of um, items in the archive list, in particular the MTFP monitoring and the capital programme monitoring, which I sort of assumed were standing items in a sense, but are they archived simply because it's a year of end and we, formed, we, have to, we need to request to put them back on again? Is it that sort of malarkey rather than it is, else. Chair. Yeah, thanks, Chair. It is. What, we'll, what I'll do is I'll work on the next work programme for the next municipal year based on the items that were on. So everything right. that's been yeah. discussed this year will be pulled forward so it's not forgotten about. And then as a committee can decide what, what you want to do, uh, what you want to keep included. Right. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Shirley. Thank you, Councillor Harker. Um, and as you'll as you notice there, there were, there were two items which, which have been deferred until the autumn, which is the economic strategy and the housing strategy, um, which, you know, for, for obvious reasons, they've, they've been de um, deferred and, until a later date where um, we can we can focus more energy on that. It's a, it's a moving piece at this moment in time. Housing strategy, obviously the local plan, um, is currently being reviewed. Um, I must apologise to members. The the last meeting um, I did suggest a, a get together to to talk about um, performance indicators, both the um, the, the the scope and the, and the presentation. Um, I decided um, not not to hold that meeting because of, of course performance indicators were coming to to this meeting, so we could review, we could discuss, and talk to officers. Um, I just put a question out there, um, uh, members. Um, still still minded um still happy to to attend a meeting because i can I can set one set one up um, with shirley's help yeah okay yeah if you could do that for for me please shirley that'd be fantastic yep no thanks will do chair appreciate that uh and we can obviously hopefully bring something to the the work program uh, at our next meeting and uh, look out over the summer okay um are there any questions or any supplementary items that people would like to, to bring uh, to the table? I know agenda item number 10 and 11 both in the same mention there. OK, um, there, there is just one one thing um, I, I would just like to, to mention um, is that uh, there, there is an event um, being held on Eventbrite, um, which um, which, which our mayor um, is is going to attend, and I'll send you a link to that. I think it'd be really, really interesting. It's looking at the the, the positive uh, economic journey that Darlington is now on at this moment in time. Uh, Mark, you want to just come in on? Yeah, th thanks, Chair. You, you stole my thunder, like all good chairs do. Um, I, that was going to be my uh, AOB. Um, I'll send I'll send Shirley the link, and then she can send it out. I think it's a really it'll, it'll be a really interesting free seminar. Um, headed by uh, Nigel Wilson, who's the Chief Executive Legal and General. And not only will it will it be looking at the, I suppose, the, the macro economic issues with, with, with COVID and, and, uh, and a changing uh, global economy, but likewise focusing very much into Darlington and the great opportunities that we have with the various types of announcements we've had recently. So thanks, Chair, for raising that. But uh, I'll send Shirley through that link as well. Thank you. Really appreciate that, Mark. OK, uh, anybody else? I've got Councillor Tate. Thank you, Chair. I've just got um, two things that I've brought down in any other business, and it's two things that have come up via the Northern Echo. Um, as, a member, as a member, I wasn't aware of them until they'd popped up and I read them online, which is always great, isn't it? Um, one of them is in regards to South Park Cafe. Um, 
I haven't seen any detail in regards to the project or in regards to it reopening under us. Um, I think as an economy and resources committee, it'd be interesting to understand why it was outsourced previously, why it's now coming back in house. Is it going to be profitable? I don't know. The second one is the weddings at the Hippodrome, and I know you touched on it earlier. Ultimately, I'll assume, and Elizabeth, if she's still on, will be able to correct me, is that weddings are an income to the council and they're currently held in the chamber. Um, what what business model arrangements will will this have, if any impact? Um, or are we thinking that the people who will choose to get married in the Hippodrome will be a completely different customer base? Um, I don't know. Um, obviously, both projects are council. Um, how do we think it will work side by side? Um, will there be any impact to income and revenue? So that was my two questions and any other business, please. South Park and the weddings at the Hippodrome. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tate. Um, um, Elizabeth and uh, I don't know if Councillor Key wants to come in. Uh, certainly, with regard to the weddings in the Hippodrome, um, it's both council income, so for it, I suppose it just gives customers more choice on where they want to get married. Um, so we're not anticipating any reduction in income. And obviously, there would be during the day, not when performances would be on. So I, I'm comfortable with that. Thank you, Councillor Tate. I, I'm not sure about the South Park Cafe, um, I'm afraid. I'd have to get back to you. I don't know if anybody else could help with that one. Um, through you, Chair. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Yep, uh, South Park uh, Cafe, they have um, decided to hold it internally. Obviously, the effects of COVID and starting a new business up, etc. Um, we, we thought it better to use um, the council, uh, go along, see how, how it's going to how it's going to perform and try and make it profitable. But, uh, you know, trying to open a, a new business and something uh, in, the, in the conditions just now, Councillor Tate, it was thought better to keep control of it because we want to try and get it open and make it available to folks and see how we can make it work. And as we go through uh, this year and next year, we'll, we'll, we'll obviously be reviewing that. So we'll keep you informed as to, as to what happens there. Um, thank you for that one, Councillor Kia. I think my, my query also related to why it was like not in our own like sort of. I'll, one, I'll, one I'll take that back. I've got, a, I've got a note of that and I'll take that back and I'll ask the question unless somebody's got any information here. But certainly um, from my point of view, I don't know the answer to that. I'll have to go back. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Harker, do you want to come in? It's on that. Same issue about South Park Cafe. Um, for recollection, it's to do with the fact simply that although in the summer and it's good days, it, it creates a lot of business and a lot of um, usage on many days. Um, the uptake of it is, is pretty small and it's tricky because it is a useful thing to have in the park, but, but realistically, it isn't a great money earner. In the past, we have run it, and from recollection, we put it out to the private sector because we were simply making a loss on it. And the issue is that if you put it to the private sector, they'll probably pay the people that work in there less than we will, um, because we tend to pay those kinds of staff better than the private sector. And often private businesses can make turn of profit simply because they're paying the staff less than we do. So it, that's why in the past it's sometimes being run by us and sometimes being run by the private sector simply because the, the, the economically it's not a particularly viable place um, to have a cafe even though it's um, and i'd certainly support it arguably it's very beneficial for the park as a whole thank you councillor harker okay um nobody else wants to come in right well thank you very much everybody for for attending this morning um I hope everyone is uh, fit and healthy and look forward to seeing you at our next meeting. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Bye. Bye.